welcome back to the poor man's chemist. <laughs> oh no, you can't stop me, child. In this video, we are going to be finishing up chapter 5. With this will be the last video that you have to get through before we can start chapter 6 and start talking about synthesis. Yay! Blam! But before we can do that, we've got to get through this. Now, as usual, if you are enjoying this series and if you are learning a lot from it, I beg of you, please consider supporting this. I've got to sell the store and try to find another line of work. Carmen, stop it! Wait, I just thought I'd play a little violin, Cap. Um, it takes a lot of time to put these videos together and make it so that it's coherent and understandable. Um, usually requires several attempts on each section before I feel like I get it right. It's beautiful! Which ends up taking for freaking ever. But it allows me to give you something that doesn't suck ass. So I feel like it's time well spent. However, your support is the only thing that allows me to take the time to do that. Otherwise, I've got to go and work at the fuck my life job and fucking hate my fucking existence. I would much rather work for you all, see, because you guys are awesome. And I would much rather make videos that are like, you know, busting down the gatekeeping of organic chemistry and making this available to the public because chemistry to them, goddamn motherfucking people. Am I right? Nigga, please. But I can only do that if you guys make it possible. So there are links in the description if you would like to support this endeavor. Um, please take note that I have recently stopped using PayPal for reasons that I will not get into here. It's, I just don't want to take all the time to explain it all. Just know that right now I am only taking in any kind of support through Subscribestar and Cash App. Um, Cash App charges us less fees, too, guys. So, I don't know. I, I mean, a lot of uh, more people are using it these days all the time, so hopefully that won't be too onerous a burden to, to place upon people. I hope. Anyway, let's get into it. So I've already told you guys about race McForms. A race McForm or a race McMixture or a race mate is where you have a 50-50 mix of two different enantiomers. So you can see in the example here, they've got the example of two butanol. So if you pass plain polarized light through a sample of R2 butanol, it will rotate the plain polarized light in the clockwise direction, um, I guess, from the perspective of over here, because that looks like it rotated it counterclockwise to me. But what do I know? I mean, if you're going to be looking at the analyzer here, and it rotates it this way, that's counterclockwise. That would make that S. I, I don't know. Maybe it's just an error in the textbook. Um, whatever. Anyway, we'll keep going on. So... Regardless, if you pass the plane polarized light through the sample, then you would get a certain rotation. If you have an equal mixture, you know, 50% R and 50% S, you will get no net rotation, all right? So a uh, race mic mixture produces no net rotation of plain polarized light. Now, if you, it's not a 50-50 mix of enantiomer, say it's 75% of one and 20% of, of another, yes, it will still rotate the plain polarized light, but it will not do it as much as it would if it was 100% R or 100% S, all right? It will only do a fraction of what it would normally do. So you can tell that, you know, there's either, you know, I mean, I guess if it was a total unknown, you could tell that if it rotates plain polarized light, it's either a pure enantiomer or it there is an enantiomeric excess in it. In other words, one enantiomer is present at a higher concentration than the other. And comes down here, it says 
the racemic form of a sample is often designated as being plus minus a racemic mixture of R2 butanol and S2 butanol might be indicated as this. So if you have ever seen this before, now you know what this means. Isn't that cool? We're making all this cryptic shit make sense. All right, so now let's go down here and talk more about enantiomeric excess. A sample of an optically active substance that consists of a single enantiomer is said to be enantiomerically pure or to have an enantiomeric excess of 100%. An enantiomerically pure sample of S2-butanol shows a specific rotation of 13.52 degrees. Now, I'm not going to read the plus or minus because once I tell you it's R or S, you could always go and consult a reference work to find out if it's dextro or levo. So, I mean, and plus, it's just cumbersome to say. You can see it on the screen. So, I'm just going to go with R and S. Um, don't forget what this notation here means. Alpha in brackets tells us that we are denoting specific rotation. Remember that the D here stands for the D line of sodium, um, which was 580-something nanometers. I'm sure it's on the screen. And 25 degrees Celsius. All right? So... On the other hand, a sample of S2-butanol that contains less than an equimolar amount of R2-butanol will show a specific rotation that is less than 13.52 degrees but greater than zero. Such a sample is said to have an enantiomeric excess less than 100%. The enantiomeric excess, which is abbreviated EE, also known as the optical purity, is defined as follows. And then you have two formulas here on how you can calculate it based on whether you know the moles of the enantiomers or you have the observed specific rotation and the specific rotation of the pure enantiomer from some reference work. Okay? I'm sure you guys can understand equations this simple, so I'm not going to say much more about that. Now, synthesis of chiral molecules. Reactions carried out with achiral reactants often lead to chiral products, like when you are sticking methylamine onto phenyl 2 propanone. In the absence of any chiral influence from a catalyst, reagent, or solvent, the outcome of such a reaction is a racemic mixture. In other words, the chiral product is obtained as a 50 50 mix of enantiomers. An example is the synthesis of 2-butanol by the nickel-catalyzed hydrogenation of butanone. In this reaction, the hydrogen molecule adds across the carbon-oxygen double bond in much the same way that it adds to a carbon-carbon double bond. All right, so you can see down here in the picture that we've got a, we have a carbonyl group it's hanging out on the surface of this metal. We've got some hydrogen atoms that are hanging out on the surface of this metal. And they are added on to the ketone here. And you end up with a hydroxyl. And because there is nothing making it prefer to bond with one side versus the other, you end up with a racemic mix of enantiomers of 2-butanol. Makes sense? That says up here. Because butanone is a chiral, there is no difference in presentation of either face of the molecule to the surface of the metal catalyst. The two faces of the trigonal planar carbonyl group interact with the metal surface with equal probability. See? See this? Because carbonyl groups, sp2 hybridized carbons, it is trigonal planar. It is a flat triangle. See? That's the geometry around this carbon here. And so either one can end up bonding to this. And that's how this works, too. You end up with, basically, it's hydrogen atoms that associate that end up getting absorbed onto the surface of the metal. And then they just kind of hang out on the surface of the metal and wander around. And then you'll end up with something else, some pi bond, usually, that comes in here. And it, too, will start interacting with the surface of the metal and then some hydrogen atoms will wander over bond to it and that's how this is all working and that's why you need the metal catalyst and that's why the reaction happens at the surface of the metal the more you know right 
We shall see that when reactions like this are carried out in the presence of a chiral influence, such as an enzyme or chiral catalyst, the result is usually not a racemic mixture. So for the person who asked me in the comments of that community post the other day where I was talking about this kind of thing, yeah, yeah, we will discuss the, you know, enantioselective syntheses very broadly. All right. Stereoselective synthesis. Stereoselective reactions are reactions that lead to a preferential formation of one stereoisomer over other stereoisomers that could possibly be formed. If a reaction produces preferentially one enantiomer over its mirror image, the reaction is said to be an enantioselective reaction. If a reaction leads preferentially to one diastereomer over others that are possible, the reaction is said to be diastereoselective reaction. For a reaction to be either enantioselective or diastereoselective, a chiral reagent, catalyst, or solvent must assert an influence on the course of the reaction. So, that's how you actually make that shit happen. So in nature, where most reactions are stereoselective, the chiral influences come from protein molecules called enzymes. Enzymes are catalysts, all right? And they are basically always chiral. So you can, and this is a trick that does get used, you can have some bacteria that's genetically engineered to produce some enzyme. You can extract the enzyme out of it, and you can use that enzyme at, in synthesis. It's usually used to synthesize other biomolecules. I mean, PCR, that's an excellent example of this kind of thing. However, you come down here. Many enzymes have found use in the organic chemistry laboratory, where organic chemists take advantage of their properties to bring about stereoselective reactions. One of these is an enzyme called lipase. Lipase catalyzes a reaction called hydrolysis, whereby an ester reacts with a molecule of water to produce a carboxylic acid and an alcohol. If the starting ester is chiral and present as a mixture of enantiomers, the lipase enzyme reacts selectively with one enantiomer to release the corresponding chiral carboxylic acid and an alcohol, while the other ester enantiomer remains unchanged or reacts much more slowly. The result is a mixture that contain, consists predominantly of one stereoisomer of the reactant and one stereoisomer of the product which can usually be separated easily on the basis of their different physical properties. Such a process is called a kinetic resolution, where the rate of a reaction with one enantiomer is different than with the other, leading to a preponderance of one product stereoisomer. All right, so and they're going to they're going to have more to say about this going on down the road. So, yes, these are the kinds of tricks you can use in order to get a enantioselective reaction to happen. Neat, right? And I would imagine as time goes on and the capabilities in molecular biology and biochemistry keep increasing, there will be more and more enzymes that are available, basically as reagents for synthesis. Enzymes are kind of a pain in the ass, though, and that a lot of them denature relatively easily, so you can't necessarily use them in very extreme conditions. Again, depends very much on the enzyme. So, moving on. Okay, now the textbook wants to talk about chiral drugs for a minute. So, the FDA and the pharmaceutical industry are very interested in the production of chiral drugs. That is, drugs that contain a single enantiomer rather than a race mate. I'm sure a lot of you out there are interested in that too. And they give you some examples here where the anti-hypertensive drug methyl dopa... Um, owes its effect exclusively to the S isomer. In the case of penicillamine, the S isomer is a highly potent therapeutic agent for primary chronic arthritis, while the R isomer has no therapeutic action and is highly toxic. The anti-inflammatory agent ibuprofen is marketed as a race mate, even though only the S enantiomer is the active agent. 
The R enantiomer of ibuprofen has no anti-inflammatory action and is slowly converted to the S isomer in the body. So, yes, a formulation of ibuprofen based solely on the S isomer would be more effective. However, it would also be much more expensive to produce, and you probably wouldn't want to buy it. Now, come down here, take a look at this question. So, it's asking you um, where are the chiral carbons in Allegra, and it wants you to come up with a structure that would have the R configuration at that carbon. So, let's take a look at this real quick, just because I think it will be instructive. So, is it this one? Nope. Two phenyl groups here. Is it this one? No, actually, because it comes around this way, it is symmetrical, and then it comes down here. There's no difference no matter which way you go. Um, so this one is not one either. None of these are it because they have two hydrogens. This one is definitely one. Up here, nope, two methyl groups, sp2. All the rest of these are sp2s, so none of them are it. So there's only one. Now, draw this such that it will have an R stereo configuration. Well, let's take a look at that shit. All right, so I have used my mad MS paint skills to copy and paste the molecule here from the textbook. And I changed it at the chiral carbon so that we have the hydrogen atom pointing away from us here, okay? So that way we can keep it in the same orientation that it was in in the textbook. So we take a look at it. Um, is this an R configuration? Well, we have the hydroxyl group here. Oxygen has highest priority, so that's A. This carbon is bonded to two other carbons and no hydrogen because we got a double bond here, but still to two other real carbons. So we got that. This one's bonded to a single carbon and two hydrogens. So this one's going to be B and this one's going to be C. Now, if we draw a circle connecting these, we are going counterclockwise. That makes this the S isomer. So we would have to flip this around here, you know, make the hy hydrogen the one that's coming out towards us and the hydroxyl the one that's going away from us in order to make this the R stereo isomer. Does everybody see that, I hope? All right, if you don't, ask questions in the comments. Moving on. Okay, moving on. Now I'm going to let you guys do this one yourselves. It's an opioid. It's an exceptionally shitty one. I don't know that it's even used anymore. If it is, avoid it because it fucking sucks. Um, God, I hate fucking propoxyphene. Fucking Darvis set. Jesus. Anyway, you can read the rest of this section yourself. Um, I assume this is like the one thing I can ask students to read on their own where I there's a snowball's chance in hell it might actually happen. Which is to say, it probably won't, but you never know. I mean, come on, kitties. Drugs. Read it. What? I don't know how to make it more appealing to you. Anyway, so, molecules with more than one chirality center. Here we go. So far, we have mainly considered chiral molecules that contain only one chirality center. Many organic molecules, especially those important in biology, wink, contain more than one chirality center. Cholesterol, for example, contains eight chirality centers. Can you locate them? You want to know a nice trick to finding them real quick? Look for the wedges. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There you go, the eight chiral carbons. Neat, right? This is not good. I mean, it works when you have a structure like this, okay? Um, when it's nice and complete and all the ones that should be denoted are denoted, yes, you can just count up the wedges. Again, double check, okay? Because there are dipshits out there that write formulas that, you know, <laughs> aren't necessarily right. We can begin, however, with simpler molecules. Let us consider 2,3-dibromopentane, shown here in a two-dimensional bond line formula. Here we go. 
2,3-dibromopentane has two chirality centers, and you can see them here, okay? A useful rule gives us the maximum number of stereoisomers. In compounds whose stereoisomerism is due to chirality centers, the total number of stereoisomers will not exceed 2 to the nth, where n is equal to the number of chirality centers. For 2,3-dibromopentane, we should not expect more than 4 stereoisomers, because 2 raised to the power of 2 is 4. Makes sense? 2 times 2 is 4. I think you guys can get that, okay? If there were 3, it would be 2 raised to the third power, which would be 8. Okay? Because 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. I know. I, 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 right? This is some next level math here, like fucking rocket science. Our next task is to write three-dimensional bond line formulas for the possible stereoisomers. So, how to draw stereoisomers for molecules having more than one chirality center. Using 2,3-dibromopentane as an example, the following sequence explains how we can draw all the possible isomers of a molecule that contains more than one chirality center. Remember that in the case of 2,3-dibromopentane, we expect a maximum of four possible isomers because there are two chirality centers. All right, we just talked about that. Start by drawing the portion of the carbon skeleton that contains the chirality centers in such a way that as many of the chirality centers are placed in the plane of the paper as possible and as symmetrically as possible. In the case of 2,3-dibromopentane, we simply begin by drawing the bond between carbon 2 and carbon 3 since these are the only two chirality centers. All right. What they're talking about with trying to make sure that as many of them as placed in the plane of the paper as possible is because remember, organic compounds are three-dimensional entities, okay? So you can have some chiral carbons in the plane of the paper. It is entirely possible you will have ones that are not, all right? So you want to try to arrange things so that you have as many in the plane of the paper as possible. For the very simple examples we will be talking about, you know, this is pretty simple. You can see it right here. Anyway, I just want to make sure I'm, you know, you thoroughly understand this. Again, ask questions if you have them. Next, we add the remaining groups that are bonded at the chirality centers in such a way as to maximize the symmetry between the chirality centers. In this case, we start by drawing the two bromine atoms so that they project either both outward or both inward relative to the plane of the the screen. I, I mean, paper, yes, if you're reading a, te a physical textbook, but I'm just going to start substituting this with screen since that's what you all are watching this shit on. And we add the hydrogen atoms at each chirality center. Drawing the bromine atoms outward results in formula one, shown below. Okay, so both of these are drawn outwards. They're pointing towards you. We all know how wedge diagrams works. Okay, even though there are eclipsing interactions in this conformation, and it is almost certainly not the most stable conformation of the molecule, we draw it this way so as to maximize the possibility of finding symmetry in the molecule. In other words, what it's saying is that Yes, we all know that this conformation is going to be not the most stable arrangement of things, but we can draw it like this for our purposes of identifying these things and figuring out what all the stereoisomers are. I, I don't know, did that really need to be said? Anyway. To draw the enantiomer of the first stereoisomer, we simply draw its mirror image by imagining a mirror between them. The result is formula 2. Okay, everybody see that? 2 is a mirror image of 1. And you can see here, all we did is this, is, this being the mirror image, now the ethyl group is over here, whereas before it was over here. Can everybody see that this is something different? I hope. To draw another stereoisomer, we interchange two groups at any one of the chirality centers. By doing so, we invert the RS configuration at that chirality center. 
All of the possible stereoisomers for a compound can be drawn by successively interchanging two groups at each chirality center. If we interchange the bromine and hydrogen atoms at C2 in formula 1 for 2,3-dibromopentane, the result is formula 3. Then to generate the enantiomer of 3, we simply draw its mirror image and the result is 4. Can everybody see that? So, we started out with this one, we, took, we drew its mirror image, so there's another one, then we basically just flipped one group see in this case in this one right here all right so then that now there the bromines are on opposite sides and then we took the mirror image of that okay next we examine the relationship between all the possible pairings of formulas to determine which are pairs of enantiomers which are diastereomers, and for special cases, like we shall see in section 5.12b, which formulas are actually identical due to an internal plane of symmetry. Alright, since structures 1 and 2 are not superposable, they represent different compounds. Since structures 1 and 2 differ only in the arrangement of their atoms in space, they represent stereoisomers. Structures 1 and 2 are also mere images of each other, thus 1 and 2 represent a pair of enantiomers. Structures 3 and 4 correspond to another pair of enantiomers. Structures 1 through 4 are all different, so there are, in total, 4 stereoisomers of 2,3-dibromopentane. At this point, you should convince yourself that there are no other stereoisomers by writing other structural formulas. Or you could just take my word for it. You will find that rotation about the single bonds or of the entire structure or of any other arrangement of the atoms will cause the structure to become superposable with one of the structures you have written here. Better yet, using different colored balls, make molecular models as you work this out. That's right, people. Play with your balls. The compounds represent... By the compounds represented by structures 1 through 4 are all optically active compounds. Any one of them, if placed separately in a polarimeter, would show optical activity. The compounds represented by structures 1 and 2 are enantiomers. The compounds represented by structures 3 and 4 are also enantiomers. But what is the isomeric relation between compounds represented by 1 and 3? We can answer this question by observing that 1 and 3 are stereoisomers and that they are not mirror images of each other, therefore they are diastereomers. Diastereomers have different physical properties, different melting points and boiling points, different solubilities, and so forth. Now you understand why I said this was going to get a fuck ton more complicated. And this is just two chirality centers, people. <laughs> there is a problem here that the textbook works through with you, so I'm going to let you read that on your own. We're trying to finish this chapter. And besides, you should be reading that shit on your own anyway. Now, meso compounds. A structure with two chirality centers does not always have four possible stereoisomers. Sometimes there are only three. So some molecules are achiral even though they contain chirality centers because it wasn't complicated enough before, right? To understand this, let us write stereochemical formulas for 2,3-dibromobutane. Okay, so now it's not a methyl group on one side and an ethyl group on the other. Now it's two identical methyl groups. We begin the same way as we did before. We write formulas for one stereoisomer and for its mirror image. Structures A and B are non-superposable and represent a pair of enantiomers. Everybody see that? We, when we write the new structure C down here and its mirror image D... The situation is different. The two structures are superposable. This means that C and D do not represent a pair of enantiomers. Formulas C and D represent identical orientations of the same compound. 
The molecule represented by structure C or D is not chiral, even though it contains two chirality centers. But you can tell because look, plane of symmetry. See, right here, plane of symmetry. All hail the mighty plane of symmetry. If a molecule has an internal plane of symmetry, it is a chiral. A meso compound is an achiral molecule that contains chirality centers and has an internal plane of symmetry. Meso compounds are not optically active. Okay, so this is a meso compound. It contains two chirality centers, but it is superposable over its mirror image. All right. Because, and you can easily see it, because, again, the almighty plane of symmetry. Okay. How to name compounds with more than one chirality center. If a compound has more than one chirality center, we analyze each center separately and decide whether it is R or S. Then, using numbers, we tell which designation refers to which carbon atom. So, if you look at the stereoisomers of 2,3-dibromobutane, and they're just going to look at one of them here, isomer, what they're calling stereoisomer A. That's not a standard name. That's just what the textbook is calling it. So, when this formula is rotated so that the group of lowest priority attached to C2 is directed away from the viewer, it resembles the following. Okay? Everybody see that? So, that is R. The order, yada, 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 I, you guys can see that this is R, I think, I hope. Now, we repeat this procedure with carbon-3, and we find that carbon-3 is also R, all right? So we would write it like this, as 2R, 3R, 2, 3, dibromobutane, okay? Everybody understand that, I hope? I, it should be pretty straightforward. Hopefully, at this point, you're getting comfortable with the con angled prelog system. And if you're having trouble seeing why this is R, remember, bromine has the highest priority. Up here, we've got a carbon that is bonded to a hydrogen, a bromine, and a methyl group. So a hydrogen, bromine, and a carbon. Down here, this carbon's bonded to three hydrogens. C, A, B, C. I really hope that makes sense. Now, Fisher projection formulas. We are not going to discuss these, okay? The textbook doesn't really use them. Come down here and where the fuck is it that talks about it? Okay, what do they say about it? Right here. Our emphasis for most of this book will be on the use of solid and dashed wedges to represent three-dimensional formulas or chair conformational structures in the case of cyclohexane derivatives, derivatives, except in Chapter 22 when we will use Fisher projections again in our discussion of carbohydrates. If your instructor wishes to utilize Fisher projections further, you will be so advised. Your instructor is telling you, we are not using these fucking things. They are tricky as hell. You have to follow, you know, all of the rules with them very strictly, or it's extremely easy to make mistakes with them. For the love of God, use solid and dashed wedges, okay? As you guys can see, I mean, I can whip those things up in five seconds and fucking paint using a mouse. I mean, it, draw it on paper, it, it takes less than a second to draw one of the fucking things. So, use the wedges, okay? It, it, they remove all ambiguity. Fucking Fisher projection formulas. You use this shit a lot in, like, biochemistry. Again, anything that is weird and off the wall, chances are it's motherfucking biochemists that fucking use that shit, man. Just like the delta notation, notation to um, indicate where double bonds are, like delta 9 THC. Because you couldn't just add the you know had the number and then een at the end of the no 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 they're fucking biochemists they gotta be fucking weirdos every goddamn time. <laughs> okay, now stereoisomerism of cyclic compounds. You can see here we have one two dimethyl cyclopentane. For trans 1,2-dimethylcyclopentane, you can see it exists as a pair of enantiomers. 
Whereas for cis 1,2 dimethyl cyclopentane, it is a meso compound. And so there is only one cis 1,2 dimethyl cyclopentane. Everybody see that? I would think that's, that's pretty clear to see. And of course, the almighty plane of symmetry allows us to see at a glance that the cis isomer is a meso compound. Okay? See, that plane of symmetry is going to be real fucking useful, right? Come on down here. Cyclohexane derivatives. 1,4-dimethylcyclohexane. If we examine a formula of 1,4-dimethylcyclohexane, we find that it does not contain any chirality centers. However, it does have two stereogenic centers. As we learned in section 4.13, 1,4-dimethylcyclohexane can exist as cis and trans isomers. The cis and trans forms are diastereomers. Neither compound is chiral, and therefore neither is optically active. Notice that both the cis and trans forms of 1,4-dimethylcyclohexane have a plane of symmetry. Oh, great and mighty plane of symmetry, without whom we are as naught. So you can see at a glance, this shit ain't chiral. See, this shit is incredibly useful, right? 1,3-dimethylcyclohexanes. What do you guys think? 1,3-dimethylcyclohexane has two chirality centers. We can therefore expect as many as four stereoisomers. In reality, there are only three. cis 1,3-dimethylcyclohexane has a plane of symmetry and is a chiral. So, we have the very same situation going on here that we had up here. Everybody see that? Okay. So the trans isomer of 1,3-dimethylcyclohexane is chiral. However, the cis isomer is not. Again, just like for the 1,2-dimethylcyclopentane. So the textbook says shit that I just said. 1,2-dimethylcyclohexanes. 1,2-dimethylcyclohexane also has two chirality centers. And again, we might expect as many as four stereoisomers. Indeed, there are four but we find that we can only isolate three. Trans 1,2-dimethylcyclohexane exists as a pair of enantiomers. Its molecules do not have a plane of symmetry. Cis 1,2-dimethylcyclohexane, shown in figure 5.20, represents a somewhat more complex situation. If we consider the two conformational structures, C and D, down here, we find that these two mirror image structures are not identical. Neither has a plane of symmetry, and each is a chiral molecule. But they are interconvertible by a chair-chair flip. So, in other words, they can be converted one from another by a ring flip. Therefore, although the two structures represent enantiomers, they cannot be separated because they rapidly interconvert even at low temperature. I told you guys this shit was going to get complicated. They simply represent different conformations of the same compound. Therefore, structures C and D are not configurational stereoisomers. They are conformational stereoisomers. This means that at normal temperatures, there are only three isolatable stereoisomers of 1,2-dimethylcyclohexane. As we shall see later, there are some compounds whose conformational stereoisomers can be isolated in enantiomeric forms, and they are actually useful in synthesis. Isomers of this type are called atrop isomers, and I'm really hoping I'm saying that right because I have only ever seen it written down. Okay, relating configurations through reactions in which no bonds to the chirality center are broken, like when you are converting ephedrine or pseudoephedrine into methamphetamine. A reaction is said to proceed with a retention of configuration at a chirality center if no bonds to the chirality center are broken. This is true even if the RS designation for the chirality center changes because the relative priorities of groups around it change as a result of the reaction. I hope that makes sense to everybody, okay? If no bonds are being broken or formed to the chiral carbon, 
then nothing changes in that carbon. Makes sense? I mean, that's, that's pretty fucking basic. First, consider an example that occurs with retention of configuration and that also retains the same RS designation in the product as in the reaction. Such is the case when S2-methyl-1-butanol reacts with hydrochloric acid to form S1-chloro-2-methyl-butanol. Note that none of the bonds at the chirality center are broken. Okay? Everybody see this? The reaction happens down here. Nothing's happening to this carbon here, so nothing changes. In this case, it just so happens that when you, you started out with it being S and you ended up with it being S, but remember, R and S is determined based on the groups that are bonded to this shit. This, the absolute stereo configuration, again, if nothing is changed at this carbon, doesn't change. All right? Everybody see that? I really hope that. I mean, that, that should be real fucking basic. And the reason why the S doesn't change here, you go from a hydroxyl to a chlorine. Okay? Both of them have higher priority than carbon. Both of, in both cases, they are going to be A. Okay? And then this shit will be B, and then this shit will be C. I, I hope you guys can see that by now. I really do. This example also reminds us that the sign of optical rotation is not directly correlated with the RS configuration of a chirality center. Since the sign of rotation changes, but the RS configuration does not. All right, everybody see that? See? This compound here, S2-methyl-1-butanol, is levo, but S1-chloro-2-methylbutane is dextra. Now, consider the reaction of R1-bromo-2-butanol with zinc and acid to form S2-butanol. At this point, we do not need to know how this reaction takes place, except to observe that none of the bonds to the chirality center are broken, and you can see it here, okay? So this is R1-bromo-2-butanol, you reduce it with zinc and acid, and you get S2-butanol out of this. Handy reaction to know. Hint, hint, wink, wink. This reaction takes place with retention of configuration because no bonds to the chirality center are broken, but the RS configuration changes because the relative priorities of the groups bonded at the chirality center changes due to substitution of hydrogen for bromine. Okay, everybody see that? Goes from R to S, even though nothing has changed at the chiral carbon. Okay? Makes sense? I hope. All right. Now, relative and absolute configurations. Reactions in which no bonds to the chirality center are broken are useful in relating configurations of chiral molecules. That is, they allow us to demonstrate that certain compounds have the same relative configuration. In each of the examples that we have just cited, the products of the reaction have the same relative configurations as the reactants. The chirality centers in different molecules have the same relative configuration if they share three groups in common and if these groups with the central carbon can be superposed in a pyramidal arrangement. In other words, do they are A, B, and C the same? So in other words, does it have three groups bonded to it that are the same? And then can we overlay it such that the X and Y, whatever they may be, will overlay here. Why are we even talking about this? Well, before 1951, only relative configurations of chiral molecules were known. No one prior to that time had been able to demonstrate with certainty what the actual spatial arrangements of groups was in any chiral molecule. Think about that. All the way up till 1950 motherfucking one, people did not know for sure what the absolute arrangements of these atoms in space were. Isn't that wild? To say this another way, no one had been able to determine the absolute configuration of an optically active compound. 
The absolute configuration of a chirality center is its R or S designation, which can only be specified by knowledge of the actual arrangement of groups in space at the chirality center. Neat, right? Prior to any known absolute configurations, the configurations of chiral molecules were related to each other through reactions of known stereochemistry. Attempts were also made to relate all configurations to a single compound that had been chosen arbitrarily to be the standard. This standard was the compound glyceraldehyde. Glyceraldehyde has one chirality center. Therefore, glyceraldehyde exists as a pair of enantiomers. Everybody see that? Okay. In one system used for designating configurations, R-glyceraldehyde is called dextroglyceraldehyde, and S-glyceraldehyde is called levoglyceraldehyde. This system of nomenclature is used with a specialized meaning in the nomenclature of carbohydrates. See? I told you. Fucking biochemists, man. It's always those goddamn biochemists. <laughs> <laughs> you know I love you guys, though. One glyceraldehyde enantiomer is dextratory, and the other, of course, is levatory. Before 1951, no one was sure, however, which configuration belonged to which enantiomer. Chemists decided arbitrarily to, design, to assign the R configuration to the plus enantiomer, the dextro one. Then, configurations of other molecules were related to the one glyceraldehyde enantiomer or the other through reactions of known stereochemistry. So, how was this all figured out? Well, the configuration of levoglyceraldehyde was also related through reactions of known stereochemistry to dextrotartaric acid. In 1951, this guy whose name I cannot pronounce the director of the Vant Hoff Laboratory at the University of Utrecht. I, I'm sorry, Dutch people, if I'm, I'm fucking that up. In the Netherlands, using a special technique of X-ray diffraction, was able to show conclusively that dextrotartaric acid had the absolute configuration shown above. So... There you go. This was the fucking Rosetta Stone of goddamn stereochemistry, man. This meant that the original arbitrary assignment of the configurations of dextro and level glyceraldehyde was also correct. Just by chance. And there was much rejoicing. I mean, they had a 50-50 shot, right? It also meant that the configurations of all of the compounds that had been related to one glyceraldehyde enantiomer or the other were now known with certainty and were now absolute configurations. So, that is how this was all figured out. And again, 1951, I mean, th this was a very big problem in chemistry for a very long time. So, you know... If you've got a TARDIS and you're going back in time, ma'am, and you, you can take just this one little picture right here, and, and you could probably change the course of human history. Isn't that fucking cool? If you could get somebody to believe you, that is. Anyway, moving on. Separation of enantiomers. Resolution. Okay, I'm going to let you read that section on your own because this video is already getting very long. For modern methods of resolution of enantiomers, one of the most useful procedures for separating enantiomers is based on the following. When a racemic, when a racemic mixture reacts with a single enantiomer of another compound, a mixture of diastereomers results. And diastereomers, because they have different melting points, boiling points, and solubilities, can be separated by conventional means. So if you can react your racemic mixture with something that, some compound that is enantiomerically pure, all right, you get a mixture of diastereomers, you separate the two, and then you do the reverse of the reaction that you did to, to derivatize it, then you can end up separating your enantiomer that way.
You can also do resolution by enzymes, whereby an enzyme selectively converts one enantiomer and a race mixture to another compound. We've already talked about that. Okay, chromatography using chiral media is also widely used to resolve enantiomers. And if I had to pick a way of resolving enantiomers, this would be my go-to fucking method. This approach is applied in high-performance liquid chromatography, HPLC, as well as other forms of chromatography. Diastereomeric interactions between molecules of the racemic mixture and the chiral chromatography medium cause enantiomers of the racemate to move through the chromatography apparatus at different rates. The enantiomers are then collected separately as they elute from the chromatography device. And yes, I, I most of my work since I've graduated college has been working in analytical labs with HPLC and UPLC, so we'll have a whole lot to say about that later on. And I can tell you here, section 20, that's way on in the textbook. Now, Compounds with chirality centers other than carbon. Any tetrahedral atom with four different groups attached to it is a chirality center. Because remember, it is a consequence of geometry. Shown here are general formulas of compounds whose molecules contain chirality centers other than carbon. Silicon and germanium are in the same group of the periodic table as carbon. They form tetrahedral compounds just like carbon does. When four different groups are situated around the central atom in silicon, germanium, and nitrogen compounds, the molecules are chiral and the enantiomers can, in principle, be separated. Sulfoxides, like certain examples of other functional groups where one of the four groups is a non-bonding electron pair, are also chiral. This is not the case for amines, however, okay? Because in amines, the barrier for... Um, the flipping of the lone pair from one part of the tetrahedron to another is very low. So amines are not chiral centers unless they are quaternary, unless they are you know, covalently bonded to four different things. Then amines can become chiral centers. All right, chiral molecules that do not possess a chirality center. <laughs> A molecule is chiral if it is not superposable on its mirror image. The presence of a tetrahedral atom with four different groups is only one type of chiral chira, is only one type of chirality center, however. While most of the chiral molecules we shall encounter have chirality centers, there are other structural attributes that can confer chirality on a molecule. For example, there are compounds that have such large rotational barriers between conformers that individual conformational isomers can be separated and purified, and some of these conformational isomers are stereoisomers. So you can see that here with BINAP, at least I think that's how you're supposed to say that acronym. Conformational isomers that are stable, isolatable compounds are called atrop isomers. The existence of chiral atrop isomers has been exploited to great effect in the develop development of chiral catalysts for stereoselective reactions. An example is BINAPS, shown below in its enantiomeric forms. Now, the reason that this thing can't rotate is because it's got these, you have a phosphorus atom here, it has two big ass benzene rings here, it's locked here with, you know, joined together and it's got these two fused benzene ring systems here, this fucking thing cannot rotate. If it tries to rotate this way, these groups will block it. If it tries to rotate this way, well, that ain't, that's a non-starter. And as you can see, you can. there are two ways of sticking this molecule together such that you get non-superposable mirror images. Neat, right? The origin of chirality in BINAP is restricted rotation around the bond between the two nearly perpendicular naphthalene rings. This torsional barrier leads to two resolvable enantiomeric conformers, S and R BINAP. I, I really hope that's what people say when they say this, so I'm not sounding like a complete fucking retard. I've never heard anybody ever say this word before. 
When each enantiomer is used as a ligand for metals such as ruthenium and rhodium bonded, bound by unshared electron pairs on the phosphorus atoms, chiral organometallic complexes result that are capable of catalyzing stereoselective hydrogenation and other important industrial reactions. Boy, that shit sounds right up my motherfucking alley. Anybody, anybody out there got some of this shit? You want to send send me some? Maybe, maybe. I, 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 If I was going to have a kid, I'd name my first born after you. Just, just saying. I tell you, I name my next dog after you. That's the best you're getting out of my gay ass. Anyway. <laughs> The significance of chiral ligands is highlighted by the industrial synthesis each year of approximately 3,500 tons of levomenthal using an isomerization reaction involving a rhodium S binat catalyst. That's what we're that's what we're using rhodium for. That's helping to drive the price of it up to make fucking menthol. Are you fucking kidding me? That's just disgusting. Allenes are compounds that also exhibit stereoisomerism. Allenes are molecules that contain the following double bond sequence. You see this here? So you've got basically two double bonds on adjacent carbons. Isn't that neat? The planes of the pi bonds of allenes are perpendicular to each other. So you see that? So there is a significant barrier to rotation here. You could have it where it's one way, or you could have it where it's the other way. I hope that makes sense. And if I'm not pronouncing this word right, again, I've only ever seen it written down. This geometry of the pi bonds causes the groups attached to the end carbon atoms to lie in perpendicular planes. And because of this, Allenes with different substituents on the end carbon atoms are chiral. See that? Allenes do not show cis-trans isomerism. Okay? Because these things are fucking at 90 degrees of each other. See that? They're perpendicular. And with that, my friends, you have made it through chapter motherfucking five. You've done it. Pat yourself on the back. You you are a fucking world champion. Hallelujah. We've done it. And what do we do? In about six weeks, we made it through five goddamn chapters. That's right. Booyah. <laughs> so the next video, we will pick it up with chapter six in nucleophilic reactions where we will start giving you all the tools for synthesis from here on out. Synthesis and functional group chemistry will become the main focus. So again, you have done it. You have fought your way through the burning hell of having to lay all the groundwork so that you two could become competent enough to finally enter the kingdom of synthesis. Truly, thou art blessed. And clearly, you've worked your ass off. So, you know, kick back, have a beer, smoke a joint, do whatever it is you do to reward yourself, um, or all of the above. Um, <laughs> because you fucking earned it, man. You fucking deserve it. Anyway, so... If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. And if you didn't like it, well, I can finally say maybe you will like the next one better. Although, if you thought the complexity was going away, oh, you poor sweet child. Subscribe, comment, share the video. Please, please send some money. And until the next one, y'all, I will see you later.